This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Beginning today's show is Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz with a livestock market update. He explains how the cattle and hog markets are doing and ag trade for different states. K-State's Chuck Rice and visiting lecturer Mark Farrell continue the show as Mark discusses what Australia is doing with regenerative agriculture and the difficulties they are facing that are similar to the United States. A conversation about trout fishing rounds out today's show. K-State Fisheries and Aquatics Extension Specialist Joe Gherkin explains what has changed about the trout fishing season and why. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update. And this week, we're joined with Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz. Lee, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me once again. And Lee, to kick off our cattle market conversation, first specifically looking at cash. Well, I think, you know, when we look at the cash market last week, it was was pretty standstill. Um, You could really say it was kind of a a replay of of the previous week. I think, you know, we were trading in that uh, 183 to 186. We did see some bids at the 185. Uh, range. And really, we didn't see a whole lot of cash trade last week. That was a bit reflected when we look at uh, slaughter numbers uh, for the week. Certainly, we're lower than the prior year, but also slower than the prior week. So I think just a little bit of slowness uh, in in cattle trade overall last week. What I do expect this coming week, I I think, is a, a more supportive fed cattle market, especially when we look at cash Futures were up every day uh, last week, except for Friday. Does kind of, I think, support a, a bit of a momentum, maybe in a bit of a stronger market. Knowing that fourth quarter supplies are, are tight, um, I think should help kind of be supportive of overall cash prices. Also, feeder cattle, I think we did see quite a bit of strength there. Again, futures were up uh, every day last week, except for Friday. There's been really good demand for calves. I think we're starting to see some of those calves with the colder weather being weaned. um, And we should start to see some of that movement here um, in the next couple of weeks. And really entering a market where there's there's rather strong demand. Um, I'll add on to that, you know, we've seen a little bit of reprieve in in corn prices. You know, last week they they were down roughly... uh, you know, three to two to three cents. So uh, overall, I think supportive for cattle feeding. Um, and, and I think, again, maybe after we've certainly taken a reprieve the last couple of weeks when we look at cattle prices, fundamentals are, I think, pointing back upwards. And so I think we're kind of getting into a fourth quarter where we're getting a bit of momentum here. And Lee, how is box beef faring? That, that's the one thing, you know, I think we've seen it a bit sluggish as a way to term it. Now, I think there's a couple of ways to look at that. Certainly, we're seeing strong box beef prices compared to a year ago levels, uh, but we maybe haven't seen that that uh, surge that we typically see late October into November. This is a real key time for beef demand. We're entering holiday season where we know beef performs really well. So I think it it really is going to help provide a barometer of how strong beef demand is holidays, but also what's going to be key is post-holidays. As you kind of get into that uh, slower period for demand that that before you get into the summer grilling, that is going to be key here to hold our cattle markets. We know seasonally supplies are going to be the tightest this spring. How high we can push those prices will be predicated on demand. You know, I've gotten the question of, are we going to see $2 fats, right, this spring? Well, you know, I'll remind us, we weren't all that far off that when we looked at futures prices not that many weeks ago, right? And so I think there's certainly an opportunity to get back there um, as we see those realized prices this spring. Demand's going to be really key for that. So once again, kind of entering the holiday season and could see that reflected for the markets. Yes, I, you know, I think, again, holidays are going to serve for a great barometer here of how high we can push these prices going forward. And Lee, as we take a step back out of the cattle market and move over into the hog market, 2023 is beating out 1998, but not in a good way. No, 1998 was the, the infamous time where we really seen hog prices go to effectively zero for, for some producers and seen really historic losses. Uh, losses at you know roughly almost thirty dollars uh, per per pig. 
Um, and, and really, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry because of, of 1998. Now, as we fast forward to 2023, uh, a lot of things have changed. But when we look at profitability, at least how we measure it here at Iowa State, kind of a barometer over time, it shows that 2023 will beat out for level of losses that that 1998 level, so over $30 per head loss. Now, again, that's not representative of every producer, but I think it gives an idea of how bad the situations currently are in, in the pork market. Now, different than 1998, though, is it's not necessarily prices. So when you look at prices, uh, in 2023, at least nominally, so before I adjust for inflation, they're actually the seventh highest ever, right? But it's when I compare those prices to the cost of production, which has drastically increased, cattle producers have felt it as well over the last several years. And so when we pair those together, we're seeing these historic losses. Now, unfortunately, 2024, as the futures markets currently suggesting, both for corn, soybean meal, and lean hog prices, doesn't look all that much better. So again, red ink as we look at 2024 for the for the hog market. That's a similar situation for the cattle market in the sense that, you know, we're seeing cost of production come down some when we look at price of corn and what that's re being reflected in, in feed rations. But for cattle feeding for 2024, there's some red ink out there, right? We're betting on the come that we're going to see higher prices given what these feeder cattle prices are. And so I think as we look at 2024, um, we're looking at two industries, both pork and cattle, that may see some challenges financially. Now, I think it's important that these industries are, are in two different spots. So as we look at the cattle market, we're seeing a downturn in the cattle inventory cycle. We're expecting higher cattle prices because of that, that tighter production. Whereas the hog market, we're kind of really, really stuck in production that hasn't changed all that much. And we would need tighter supplies or stronger demand to, to see those, those prices uh, be supportive. So, you know, what I'm looking at in the pork market is we could certainly see some structural changes going forward. Uh, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in contract production was about 21% back in 1996. It's about 52% today. So I think you could see more concentration uh, as we go forward as a way to, you know, navigate really these challenging times in the hog market. So something, while maybe not as important to Kansas producers, the hog market, definitely something that Iowa State is keeping an eye on. Well, I think generally agriculture in general, right? So I, I think, you know, we always look for, for the health of the agricultural sector because it's really important to the economies in, in our individual states, uh, right? And so I think, you know, it is important to, to be aware um, and understanding that, you know, I think some of the same factors that are impacting the, the pork market can certainly impact the beef market, right? We really, one thing I think that prevails across all of them is consumer demand, right? We we care about consumer demand, right? Because ultimately a dollar more spent by a consumer, that's going to trickle into the respective industries. And so as we think about you know, consumer incomes and, and the impact of inflation, that's important for all, all of these sectors. Certainly, stronger demand would be helpful for both beef and pork going forward. And thinking about the different states, what has ag trade looked like? That, that's a great question. And USDA's Economic Research Service recently released some data. Um, actually, on Halloween, they released that data. And what they do is annually, they look back. So the most recent data would be for 2022. And they say, you know, what's the contribution of, of exports from each individual state? And realizing that that's not an easy number to calculate, uh, right? Because to track it back to an individual state is pretty difficult. I'll take corn, for example, right? We produce corn in Kansas, we produce corn in Iowa, but that corn goes to a smaller elevator, likely goes to a larger elevator, finally makes it to a port that's exported, right? So tracing back those individual kernels to a particular state is not easy, right? So what USDA does is they say, well, here are the farm receipts for a particular state. So I'll take the state of Iowa, uh, for example, right? We're the largest corn producing state, so we're gonna have the most receipts for corn. And they take the share of the US, uh, those farm receipts represent, and then they multiply that by the total export value for a particular commodity. So in the case of, of corn, for example, Iowa's 17.8% of the, of the cash receipts. 
Um, and so you multiply that by the total value uh, of exports of corn, um, and you get the $3.3 billion value that, that Iowa exports of corn. As we look at Kansas, you know, Kansas for corn is actually, as I look at it, the seventh highest uh, when you look at as corn exporter. Now, where Kansas leads, for example, not surprisingly, is beef, right? So beef, actually, they are the second largest beef exporting state. Uh, when we look at it from the share of cash receipts. And so they are 13.4% of the U.S. beef exports are, are from Kansas. And so we can do that for each individual commodity. Collectively, when you look at, at all the total exports, uh, California leads as they export a lot of high value commodities in the form of fruits and vegetables. Iowa is actually second. Uh, and Kansas comes in eighth, uh, eighth highest when you look at total value of, of exports. And so, you know, I think as, as we had the discussion about demand, export demand is certainly critical here. And as we look at what that contributes to an individual state uh, is very important for, for supporting that state's economy. And if people would like to find that report, how can they do that, Lee? So that is on the USDA Economic Research Service uh, website. Um, if you look at state agricultural trade data, uh, it's available on, on that uh, particular website. It's a spreadsheet that you can download and, and kind of look at the state rankings and, and the, the, the value that each stage contributes. Lee, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us a cattle and hog market update. Thanks for having me once again. I look forward to joining again soon. That was Iowa State University livestock economist Lee Schultz. I will link the resource that he mentioned in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Monday show with a conversation with the fourth Chuck and Sue Rice International Agronomy Lecturer, Dr. Mark Farrell, who is the Principal Research Scientist at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, as well as Chuck Rice, a K-State University Distinguished Professor in Agronomy. Chuck, Mark, I appreciate you both taking the time to join us today. Thank Thank you. you. And Mark, before we hop into some of the work you've been doing, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I grew up in the United Kingdom originally. I grew up around Manchester. I moved to North Wales to do my study, my undergraduate um, BSc and PhD, and also did my first postdoc there. I then moved to Australia over 13 years ago, where I've been working in South Australia for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. We call it the CSIRO, makes it easier to slip off the tongue. My background has been working on broadly in soils, various different aspects, um, but particularly carbon and nitrogen. And what is this research program that you've been working with? So funded from a number of different sources, but principally working in dryland systems in Australia. So mainly wheat cropping where we are, increasing with a diverse range of rotations. And particularly looking at the interplay between carbon and nitrogen in soils and how management decisions affect those and how in turn those properties affect um, sustainability and productivity within the system. Your lecture is called Perhaps, Perhaps Not, Building Carbon in Dryland Systems. And you mentioned beforehand that kind of looking at regenerative agriculture approaches. So yes, and this is a, an interesting point to note that a lot of Australian systems through necessity of water availability and a very variable changeable climate, a lot of the main tenets of regenerative agriculture have actually been practiced there for a long time already. Um, And that leaves us with an interesting case when a a new moniker gets badged for all practice that it's a lot of farmers there in in Australia are are perhaps a little puzzled at times by some of the things that they're being asked to do in this space because they've already been doing them for 20 years. Um, No tillage and stubble retention being the prime examples there. And Mark, you mentioned regenerative agriculture and trying to build up organic matter. However, before we started this, you talked about a push and pull between building organic matter and nitrogen. So yes, in these vast land areas that are managed in Australia, and bearing in mind that the land mass of Australia is broadly similar to the contiguous US, but we have less than a tenth of the population. So managing this large land area has to come from what is done on the farm quite often. There's not opportunities, by and large, for organic amendments, for manures, biosolids, etc. There are in some small localised areas, but there simply isn't enough of the material. So the only way that we can build organic matter in these systems is ultimately to grow it there. And, and that's where nitrogen comes in. In these broadacre systems, so these expansive 
dryland systems. We typically in Australia apply slightly less fertiliser each year than is removed in grain at harvest. That doesn't account for losses. It also doesn't count for other inputs that might come from free living fixation, but those are typically presumed to be small. So really what we have is a system that is ever so slightly in deficit of nitrogen each year. And the only place that nitrogen is coming from is from mineralisation and turnover of organic matter. The very same thing that regenerative approaches and indeed grows more generally are trying to conserve and build. And so there's quite a lot of mixed messaging going on that we should be looking at reducing fertiliser inputs to reduce impact on the environment, whereas in these systems, reducing fertiliser inputs further is likely to actually have the opposite effect. And so with that deficit of nitrogen, what impacts does it have for producers? So we're seeing over time that growers very rarely target maximum yield as being the most profitable. They target the most profitable yield, which is normally a a few notches back from what would be absolutely attainable. Now, because these systems have been subsidised by the organic matter mineralisation, either from land clearing or, in a lot of cases, the move away from a long perennial pasture phase as livestock have been removed from the system, again, because it's easier and perhaps more profitable to be 100% grain growing rather than having livestock in the system. What we've seen is potentially a slide back down that curve to the point where there is less and less ability of the organic matter to mineralise nitrogen and release it to the crop. So that has to be counteracted by more fertiliser being applied. But that more fertiliser isn't being applied, so the system just slides further and further backwards. Now, the reason why we haven't, why the alarm bells haven't been rung that much about it is... The great improvements that we've made in crop breeding and in the management of the agronomy of the crop, management of disease, managing to get crops out of the ground in years when previously they wouldn't have been able to do so. So a lot of that has been offset to some extent by other, by other gains. But the fact of the matter is that if you're continually applying less of something than you're taking out, just as your bank manager, um, you will have a problem. And I think that is an issue that a lot of Australian farmers are starting to recognise, that they want to manage organic matter better, they recognise that perhaps more nitrogen is required than they had been thinking of previously. But they're very nervous because of a lot of conversation about suggestions that applying more nitrogen loses carbon. And some of that has come from perhaps some misinterpretations of studies in the past. But some of these things stick. We're all aware of the potentially environmentally damaging nature of having too much nitrogen in the environment. So there's a general cautious approach to it. Um... Although that said, it doesn't just have to come from fertiliser. In Australian systems in particular, there is an awful lot of interest in growing legumes for grain. There appears to be an increasing market for the pulse, for pulses in their own right. Indeed, certainly around where I work in South Australia, there's been a bit of a joke from a few agronomists that they're now looking at break crops for the lentils rather than using lentils as a break crop as an example of diversification. And Mark, you mentioned also that with the drylands potential of cover crops. Yes. So a number one principle for soil health more generally is keeping the, keeping the living plant in the system for as long as possible. Um, there's studies from Europe and America showing that the number one aspect is having a plant there. Number two, three and four are, are what that plant is and diversity within that system. The real driver is actually having something living there or not. Now that works fine in places where it rains. Australia, of course, is famous for being very dry. And at the extreme dry end of the cropping area in Australia can be around about eight inches of rainfall might be the average. So very, very dry areas. So... One overriding principle of best practice for a long time now, these systems have been no-till and stubble retention for a long time. The main principle has been to try and prevent any green growth during summer to conserve stored moisture so that they can get a crop to finish. And that runs fairly counterintuitive to the idea of trying to establish a cover crop in summer to grow and produce more biomass and, and provide those carbon inputs. So we've been working on a project that spanned Sorry, I was trying to work in Imperial here. Um, spanned a rainfall gradient of yeah about 10 inches through to 50, 60 inches, I think, of rainfall. And really looking at where the tipping points were as to whether or not a cover crop was helping or hindering the performance of the system. And our emerging findings are that even at the driest end, if you are prepared to forego a rotation, a cash crop rotation, and plant the cover crop solely as a break crop, and we grow most of our crops in winter, so they're sown in our late autumn, um, March, April. 
and then harvested around October through to December. So that's our growing season. So germinate before winter, sit and grow a little bit during the colder months and then really take off in spring and go through to harvest quite quickly. So there is that period over summer in wetter areas where you, you will get substantial summer rainfall events and it's quite plausible to grow a sizable biomass crop there. The question is whether or not it's better to have grown that crop or have saved the water to contribute to the cash crop. Chuck, as we bring it just a little bit closer to home, how does this relate to Kansas or the United States? Yeah, well, one of the reasons we had Mark come was that we have a USDA sustainable ag systems project. It's a $10 million project that we're in the fourth year of. And what we're trying to do is look at wheat-based systems, but how do we intensify and diversify those those systems for the reasons that Mark mentioned. One is the weather variability. We're not down to 10 inches, although maybe some years we are. But the extremes, we can, even here in Manhattan, we can run from 40 inches to 20 inches. And so we're trying to look at those weather variabilities in order to modify our nitrogen recommendations. So that that's one of the challenges that Mark talked about, and we're constrained a little bit because of the weather variability, as we know. The other thing that uh, is important is that we have a soil health network across the state of Kansas. Kansas Corn has been funding that effort. But what we're looking at is how do we look at those wheat systems or those and building cover crops to improve soil health that will build up organic matter, and then we can realize the benefit of nitrogen, and then we can modify our nitrogen recommendations to account for that increase in organic matter. So first we've got to increase organic matter, and then we can modify those systems. One thing that is important is that in improving soil health, not just nitrogen, it's also water. We build soil structures so we can capture those intense rainstorm events and make better use of the water that we can capture. And Mark, if people would like to keep kind of up to date or see the work you've been working on, where can they do that? So probably the best place for that would be my CSIRO web profile. I'm easily searchable online and I believe the link will be provided. That was Dr. Mark Farrell, a principal research scientist at Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. And he is the fourth Chuck and Sue Rice International Agronomy Lecturer. And he was joined by Chuck Rice, a K-State University Distinguished Professor in Agronomy. I will link the resources that Mark mentioned in today's show notes, which you can find on Act today.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Monday show with an update from K-State's Wildlife Department. And today, we're joined by K-State Fisheries and Aquatics Extension Specialist, Joe Gherkin. Joe, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me back. Joe, today, discussing trout and its fishing season. So what is the trout fishing season? Yeah, so Kansas has a trout fishing season in the colder months, and those dates have changed a little bit. That used to extend from... November 1st to April 15th. This year, KUWP, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, decided to change that up a little bit and shorten the season. So it's now going to start on December 1st and extend through the end of March. And so that change was made by KDWP based on angler survey. So they didn't just come in and slam their fist down and say they were changing it. They talked to anglers and they kind of came up with a plan that they thought would maximize the fishing opportunity for trout in Kansas. So the date change also important for the fish then? Yeah, so these are cold water fish. That's important to remember. And so we've had some, our warm season has extended in Kansas. And so, uh, you know, moving that date back to December 1st before we start the season is really important. That helps the fish acclimate better. There's lower mortality, lower disease when these fish are introduced into bodies of water that are cold, that they're going to thrive in. So it's a little bit shorter season, but that shorter season is going to provide some better opportunities for the anglers. At least that's what we're hoping for. And something important to follow is rules. And you do need a permit to do this. Yeah, so there's a special permit that you need. It's a trout fishing permit. And one of the unique things.
things about this permit is that everyone needs it. And so it's $14.50 for anyone over the age of 16. There's a youth permit that's $7. So youth generally don't need a fishing license, but they do require this trout permit. That's important to remember. And anyone that is out trout fishing needs to have a valid fishing license. And so make sure that you're covering that regulation as well and following the rules. And some of those fees with that trout fishing license, does that help with then stocking the animal? Yeah, so KDWP stocks about 60,000 pounds of rainbow trout at about 30 different bodies of water in Kansas. And one of the ways that they help to cover the cost of stocking those fish is by taking these trout permits and allocating some of that money back towards the stocking programs. And for someone who's looking for that permit, where could they find it? Yeah, so any retailer where you could buy a fishing license would have it. You know, most of the big box stores where you could go or local bait and tackle type stores would have it. You can also go to Kansas. Department of Wildlife and Parks website, and they have that trout stamp or that permit available to purchase on their website as well. And Joe, trout is not the only fish for cold water fishing. Yeah, so there's, you know, this is a unique opportunity. The trout are put out there, and a lot of people like to go fish for those. You can catch up to five a day and have 15 in your possession. So it's a fun fish to eat, and it provides some unique opportunities. So, you know, one of the things we think about with trout is fly fishing. And there's a lot of fish that you can catch with flies in Kansas, but trout are kind of that typical fly fishing fish that we want to go after. So it provides unique opportunities. You can still fish for a lot of the other fish that we have in Kansas. So catfish will still be biting, you know, bass, crappie, bluegill, all those fish will still be biting, not as much maybe as they would be in some of the warmer months, but it's still a good excuse to get out and get around water in those colder months. And Joe, as you spent a lot of your time outside and fishing, what is your favorite thing to go out and do? I think that, you know, we keep talking about ponds. A lot of times we tend to focus on something that's maybe going wrong around these bodies of water. I think just getting outside and around the water is a really fun thing to do. And so when it tends to get warmer, we think intuitively, hey, let's go swimming or let's go fishing. But I want to remind listeners that there's a lot of opportunities in the colder months to get out there. And you can see a lot of really cool things. So trout are a fantastic example of an opportunity to get out by these bodies of water. But there's a lot of migratory birds that we can see start moving in. Waterfowl, ducks start to really pop up. One of the really cool things that we'll start to see relatively soon are bald eagles. And so bald eagles, a large percentage of their diet is on fish. And so you'll see them a lot of times around these bodies of water. So trout fishing is a great opportunity to get out and, you know, go after this kind of unique fish that KDWP is doing a great job of giving us that opportunity for. But really, I just would encourage everyone to go spend some time around water in these colder months. It's such a great time of year, changing colors and lots of of unique critters out there to look at. That was K-State Fish Fisheries and Aquatics Extension Specialist Joe Gherkin. I'll put the resources that he mentioned in today's show notes on agtoday.net. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow.